One day my mother told me that we were going to Memphis on a boat, the Kate Adams, and my eagerness thereafter made the day seem endless. Each night I went to bed hoping that the next morning would be the day of departure. How big is the boat? I asked my mother. As big as a mountain, she said. Has it got a whistle? Yes. Does the whistle blow? Yes. When? When the captain wants it to blow. Why do they call it the Kate Adams? Because that's the boat's name. What color is the boat? White. How long will we be on the boat? All day and all night. Will we sleep on the boat? Yes, when we get sleepy, we'll sleep. Now hush. For days, I had dreamed about a huge white boat floating on a vast body of water. But when my mother took me down to the levee on the day of leaving, I saw a tiny, dirty boat that was not at all like the boat I had imagined. I was disappointed, and when time came to go on board, I cried, and my mother thought that I did not want to go with her to Memphis, and I could not tell her what the trouble was. Solace came when I wandered about the boat and gazed at Negroes throwing dice, drinking whiskey, playing cards, lolling on boxes, eating, talking, and singing. My father took me down into the engine room and the throbbing machines enthralled me for hours. In Memphis, we lived in a one-story brick tenement. The stone buildings and the concrete pavements looked bleak and hostile to me. The absence of green, growing things made the city seem dead. Living space for the four of us, my mother, my brother, my father, and me, was a kitchen and a bedroom. In the front and rear were paved areas in which my brother and I could play. But for days I was afraid to go into the strange city streets alone. It was in this tenement that the personality of my father first came fully into the orbit of my concern. He worked as a night porter in a Bill Street drugstore and he became important and forbidding to me only when I learned that I could not make noise when he was asleep in the daytime. He was the lawgiver in our family, and I never laughed in his presence. I used to lurk timidly in the kitchen doorway and watch his huge body sitting slumped at the table. I stared at him with awe as he gulped his beer from a tin bucket, as he ate long and heavily, sighed, belched, closed his eyes to nod on a stuffed belly. He was quite fat and his bloated stomach always lapped over his belt. He was always a stranger to me, always somehow alien and remote. Hunger stole upon me so slowly that at first I was not aware of what hunger really meant. Hunger had always been more or less at my elbow when I played, but now I began to wake up at night to find hunger standing at my bedside, staring at me gauntly. The hunger I had known before, this had been no grim, hostile stranger. It had been a normal hunger that had made me beg constantly for bread, and when I ate a crust or two I was satisfied. But this new hunger baffled me, scared me made me angry and insistent. Whenever I begged for food now, my mother would pour me a cup of tea, which was still the clamor in my stomach for a moment or two, but a little later I would feel hunger nudging my ribs, twisting my empty guts until they ached. I would grow dizzy and my vision would dim. I became less active in my play, and for the first time in my life, 
I had to pause and think of what was happening to me. Mama, I'm hungry, I complained one afternoon. Jump up and catch a hungry, she said, trying to make me laugh and forget. What's a hungry? It's what little boys eat when they get hungry, she said. What does it taste like? I don't know. Then why do you tell me to catch one? Because you said that you were hungry, she said, smiling. I sensed that she was teasing me, and it made me angry. But I'm hungry. I want to eat. You'll have to wait. But I want to eat now. But there's nothing to eat, she told me. Why? Just because there's none, she explained. But I want to eat. I said, beginning to cry. You'll just have to wait, she said again. But why? For God to send some food. When is he going to send it? I don't know. But I'm hungry. She was ironing, and she paused and looked at me with tears in her eyes. Where's your father? She asked me. I stared in bewilderment. Yes, it was true that my father had not come home to sleep for many days now, and I could make as much noise as I wanted. Though I had not known why he was absent, I had been glad that he was not there to shout his restrictions at me. But it had never occurred to me that his absence would mean that there would be no food. I don't know, I said. Who brings food into this house? My mother asked me. Papa, I said. He always brought food. Well, your father isn't here now, she said. Where is he? I don't know, she said. But I'm hungry, I whimpered, stomping my feet. You'll have to wait until I get a job and buy food, she said. As the days slid past, the image of my father became associated with my pangs of hunger, and whenever I felt hunger, I thought of him with a deep biological bitterness. My mother finally went to work as a cook and left me and my brother alone in the flat each day with a loaf of bread and a pot of tea. When she returned at evening, she would be tired and dispirited and would cry a lot. Sometimes, when she was in despair, she would call us to her and talk to us for hours, telling us that now we had no father, that our lives would be different from those of other children, that we must learn as soon as possible to take care of ourselves, to dress ourselves, to prepare our own food, that we must take upon ourselves the responsibility of the flat while she worked. Half frightened, we would promise solemnly. We did not understand what had happened between our father and our mother, and the most that these long talks did to us was to make us feel a vague dread. Whenever we asked why father had left, she would tell us that we were too young to know. One evening, my mother told me that thereafter, I would have to do the shopping for food. She took me to the corner store to show me the way. I was proud. I felt like a grown-up. The next afternoon I looped the basket over my arm and went down the pavement toward the store. When I reached the corner, a gang of boys grabbed me, knocked me down, snatched the basket, took the money, and sent me running home in panic. That evening I told my mother what had happened, but she made no comment. She sat down at once, wrote another note, gave me more money, and sent me out to the grocery again. I crept down the steps and saw the same gang of boys playing down the street. I ran back into the house. What's the matter? My mother asked. It's those same boys, 
I said. They'll beat me. You got to get over that, she said. Now go on. I'm scared, I said. Go on and don't pay any attention to them, she said. I went out of the door and walked briskly down the sidewalk, praying that the gang would not molest me. But when I came abreast of them, someone shouted, There he is! They came toward me, and I broke into a wild run toward home. They overtook me and flung me to the pavement. I yelled, pleaded, kicked, but they wrenched the money out of my hand. They yanked me to my feet gave me a few slaps and sent me home sobbing. My mother met me at the door. They b b b beat me, I gasped. They t t t t t took the money. I started up the steps, seeking the shelter of the house. Don't you come in here, my mother warned me. I froze in my tracks and stared at her. But they're, they're coming after me, I said. You just stay right where you are, she said in a deadly tone. I'm going to teach you this night to stand up and fight for yourself. She went into the house and I waited, terrified, wondering what she was about. Presently she returned with more money and another note. She also had a long heavy stick. Take this money, this note, and this stick, she said. Go to the store and buy those groceries. If those boys bother you, then fight. I was baffled. My mother was telling me to fight, a thing that she had never done before. But I'm scared. Don't you come into this house until you got gotten those groceries, she said. They'll beat me, they'll beat me, I said. Then stay in the streets. Don't come back here. I ran up the steps and tried to force my way past her into the house. A stinging slap came in on my jaw. I stood on the sidewalk crying. Please let me wait until tomorrow, I begged. No, she said. Go now. If you come back into this house without those groceries, I'll whip you. She slammed the door, and I heard the key turn in the lock. I shook with fright. I was alone upon the dark, hostile streets, and gangs were after me. I had the choice of being beaten at home or away from home. I clutched the stick, crying, trying to reason. If I were beaten at home, there was absolutely nothing that I could do about it. But if I were beaten in the streets, I had a chance to fight and defend myself. I walked slowly down the sidewalk, coming closer to the gang of boys holding the stick tightly. I was so full of fear that I could scarcely breathe. I was almost upon them now. There he is again. The cry went up. They surrounded me quickly and began to grab for my hand. I'll kill you! I threatened. They closed in. In blind fear, I let the stick fly. Feeling it crack against a boy's skull, I swung again, lambing another skull. Then another, realizing that they would retaliate if I let up for about a second, I fought to lay them low, to knock them cold, to kill them so they could not strike back at me. I flayed with tears in my eyes, teeth clenched, stark fear making me throw every ounce of my strength behind each blow. I hit again and again, dropping the money and the grocery list. The boys scattered, yelling, nursing their heads staring at me in utter disbelief. They had never seen such a frenzy. I stood panting, egging them on, taunting them to come on and fight. When they refused, I ran after them, and they tore out for their homes, 
screaming. The parents of the boys rushed into the streets and threatened me, and for the first time in my life, I shouted at grown-ups, telling them that I would give them the same if they bothered me. I finally found my grocery list and the money and went to the store. On my way back, I kept my stick poised for instant use, but there was not a single boy in sight. That night, I won the right to the streets of Memphis. After my father's desertion, my mother's ardently religious disposition dominated the household and I was often taken to Sunday school where I met God's representative in the guise of a tall black preacher. One Sunday, my mother invited the tall black preacher to a dinner of fried chicken. I was happy, not because the preacher was coming, but because of the chicken. One or two neighbors also were invited, but no sooner had the preacher arrived than I began to resent him, for I learned at once that he, like my father, was used to behaving and having his own way. The hour for dinner came, and I was wedged at the table between talking and laughing adults. In the center of the table was a huge platter of golden brown fried chicken. I compared the bowl of soup that sat before me with the crispy chicken and decided in favor of the chicken. The others began to eat their soup, but I could not touch mine. Eat your soup, my mother said. I don't want any, I said. You won't get anything else until you've eaten your soup, she said. The preacher had finished his soup and had asked that the platter of chicken be passed to him. It galled me. He smiled, cocked his head this way and that, picking out choice pieces. I forced a spoonful of soup down my throat and looked to see if my speed matched that of the preacher. It did not. There were already bare chicken bones on his plate. He was reaching for more. I tried to eat my soup faster, but it was no use. The other people were now serving themselves chicken and the platter was more than half empty. I gave up and sat staring in despair at the vanishing pieces of fried chicken. Eat your soup or you won't get anything, my mother warned. I looked at her appealingly and could not answer as piece after piece of chicken was eating. I was unable to eat my soup at all. I grew hot with anger. The preacher was laughing and joking, and the grown-ups were hanging on his words. My growing hate of the preacher finally became more important than God or religion and could no longer contain itself. I leapt up from the table, knowing that I should be ashamed of what I was doing but unable to stop, and screamed, running blindly from the room, That preacher's going to eat all the chicken! I bawled. The preacher tossed back his head and roared with laughter, but my mother was angry and told me that I was to have no dinner because of my bad manners. When I awakened one morning, my mother told me that we were going to see a judge who would make my father When I awakened one morning, my mother told me that we were going to see a judge who would make my father support me and my brother. An hour later, all three of us were sitting in a huge crowded room. I was overwhelmed by the many faces and the voices which I could not understand. High above me was a white face, which my mother told me was the face of the judge. Across the huge room sat my father smiling confidently, looking at us. My mother warned me not to be fooled by my father's friendly manner. She told me that the judge might ask me questions, and then if he did, I must tell him the truth. I agreed, yet I hoped that the judge would not ask me anything. For some reason, the entire thing struck me as being useless. 
I felt that if my father was going to feed me, then he would have done so regardless of what the judge said to him. And I did not want my father to feed me. I was hungry, but my thoughts of food did not now center about him. I waited, growing restless, hungry. My mother gave me a dry sandwich, and I munched and stared, longing to go home. Finally, I heard my mother's name called. She rose and began weeping so copiously that she could not talk for a few moments. At last, she managed to say that her husband had deserted her and two children, that her children were hungry, that they stayed hungry, that she worked, that she was trying to raise them alone. Then my father was called. He came forward jauntily, smiling. He tried to kiss my mother, but she turned away from him. I only heard one sentence of what he said. I'm doing all I can, yeah. <laughs> he mumbled, grinning. It had been painful to sit and watch my mother crying and my father laughing. And I was glad when we were outside in the sunny streets. Back at home, my mother wept again and talked complainingly about the unfairness of the judge who had accepted my father's word. After the court scene, I tried to forget my father. I did not hate him. I simply did not want to think of him. Often, when we were hungry, my mother would beg me to go to my father's job and ask him for a dollar, a dime, a nickel. But I would never consent to go. I did not want to see him. My mother fell ill, and the problem of food became an acute, daily agony. Hunger was with us always. Sometimes the neighbors would feed us, or a dollar bill would come in the mail from my grandmother. It was winter, and I would buy a dime's worth of coal each morning from the corner coal yard and lug it home in paper bags. For a time, I remained out of school to wait upon my mother. Then Granny came to visit us and I returned to school. At night, there were long, halting discussions about our growing to live with Granny, but nothing came of it. Perhaps there was not enough money for railroad fare. Angered by having been hauled into court, my father now spurned us completely. I heard long, angrily whispered conversations between my mother and grandmother to the effect that that woman ought to be killed for breaking up a home. What irked me was the ceaseless talk and no action. If someone had suggested that my father be killed, I would perhaps have become interested. If someone had suggested that his name never be mentioned, I would no doubt have agreed. If someone had suggested that we move to another city, I would have been glad. But there was only endless talk that led nowhere and I began to keep away from home as much as possible, preferring the simplicity of the streets to the worried, futile talk at home. Finally, we could no longer pay the rent for our dingy flat. The few dollars that Granny had left us before she went home were gone. Half sick and in despair, my mother made the rounds of the charitable institutions seeking help. She found an orphan home that agreed to assume the guidance of me and my brother, provided my mother worked and made small payments. My mother hated to be separated from us, but she had no choice. The orphan home was a two-story frame building set amid trees in a wide green field. My mother ushered me and my brother one morning into the building and into the presence of a tall, gaunt, mulatto woman who called herself Miss Simon. At once, she took a fancy to me and I was frightened speechless. I was afraid of her the moment I saw her and my fear lasted during my entire stay in the home.
The house was crowded with children and there was always a storm of noise. The daily routine was blurred to me and I never quite grasped it. The most abiding feeling I had each day was hunger and fear. The meals were skimpy and there were only two of them. Just before was hunger and fear. The meals were skimpy and there were only two of them. Just before we went to bed each night, we were given a slice of bread smeared with molasses. The children were silent, hostile, vindictive, continuously complaining of hunger. There was an overall atmosphere of nervousness and intrigue, of children telling tales upon others, of children being deprived of food to punish them. The home did not have the money to check the growth of the wide stretches of grass by having it mown. So it had to be pulled by hand. Each morning after we had eaten a breakfast that seemed like no breakfast at all, an older child would lead a herd of us to the vast lawn and we would get to our knees and wrench the grass loose from the dirt with our fingers. At intervals Miss Simon would make a tour of inspection, examining the pile of pulled grass beside each child, scolding or praising according to the size of the pile. Many mornings I was too weak from hunger to pull the grass. I would grow dizzy and my mind would become blank and I would find myself after an interval of unconsciousness upon my hands and knees, my head whirling my eyes staring in bleak astonishment at the green grass, wondering where I was, feeling that I was emerging from a dream. During the first days, my mother came each night to visit me and my brother. Then her visit stopped. I began to wonder if she too, like my father, had disappeared into the unknown. I was rapidly learning to distrust everything and everybody. When my mother did come, I asked her why had she remained away so long, and she told me that Miss Simon had forbidden her to visit us, that Miss Simon had said that she was spoiling us with too much attention. I begged my mother to take me away. She wept and told me to wait that soon she would take us to Arkansas. She left and my heart sank. Miss Simon tried to win my confidence. She asked me if I would like to be adopted by her if my mother consented and I said no. She would take me into her apartment and talk to me but her words had no effect. Dread and distrust had already become a daily part of my being and my memory grew sharp, my senses more impressionable. I began to be aware of myself as a distinct personality striving against others. I held myself in, afraid to act or speak until I was sure of my surroundings, feeling most of the time that I was suspended over a void my imagination soared. My imagination soared. I dreamed of running away. Each morning I vowed that I would leave the next morning. But the next morning always found me afraid. One day Miss Simon told me that thereafter I was to help her in the office. I ate lunch with her and strangely when I sat facing her at the table, my hunger vanished. The woman killed something in me. Next, she called me to her desk where she sat addressing envelopes. Step up close to the desk, she said. Don't be afraid. I went and stood at her elbow. There was a wart on her chin and I stared at it. Now take a blotter from over there and blot each envelope 
after I'm through writing on it. She instructed me, pointing to a blotter that stood about a foot from my hand. I stared and did not move or answer. Take the blotter, she said. I wanted to reach for the blotter and succeeded only in twitching my arm. Here, she said sharply, reaching for the blotter and shoving it into my fingers. She wrote in an envelope and pushed it toward me, holding the blotter in my hand. I stared at the envelope and could not move. Blot it, she said. I could not lift my hand. I knew what she had said. I knew what she wanted me to do. And I had heard her correctly. I wanted to look at her and say something. Tell her why I could not move, but my eyes were fixed upon the floor. I could not summon enough courage while she sat there looking at me to reach over the yawning space of twelve inches and blot the wet ink on the envelope. Blot it, she said shortly. Still I could not move or answer. Look at me. I could not lift my eyes. She reached her hand to my face and I twisted away. What's wrong with you? She demanded. I began to cry and she drove me from the room. I decided that as soon as night came, I would run away. The dinner bell rang and I did not go to the table, but hid in a corner of the hallway. When I heard the dishes rattling at the table, I opened the door and ran down the walk to the street. The dusk was falling. Doubt made me stop. It was falling. Doubt made me stop. Would I go back? No. Hunger was back there and fear. I went on, coming to concrete sidewalks. People passed me. Where was I going? I did not know. The farther I walked, the more frantic I became. In a confused and vague way, I knew that I was doing more running away from than running toward something. I stopped. The streets seemed dangerous. The buildings were massive and dark. The moon shone and the trees loomed frighteningly. No, I could not go on. I would go back. But I had walked so far and had turned too many corners and had not kept track of the direction. Which way led back to the orphan home? I did not know. I was lost. I stood in the middle of the sidewalk and cried. A white policeman came to me and I wondered if he was going to beat me. He asked me what was the matter and I told him that I was trying to find my mother. His white face created a new fear in me. I was remembering the tale of the white man who had beaten the black boy. A crowd gathered and I was urged to tell where I lived. Curiously, I was too full of fear to cry now. I wanted to tell the white face that I had run off from an orphan home and that Miss Simon ran it, but I was afraid. Finally, I was taken to the police station where I was fed. I felt better. I sat in a big chair where I was surrounded by white policemen, but they seemed to ignore me. Through the window I could see that night had completely fallen and that lights now gleamed in the streets. I grew sleepy and dozed. My shoulder was shaking gently and I opened my eyes and looked into a white face of another policeman who was sitting beside me. He asked me questions in a quiet confidential tone and quite before I knew it, he was not white anymore. I told him that I had run away from an orphan home and that Miss Simon ran it. It was but a matter of minutes before I was walking alongside a policeman heading toward the home. The policeman led me to the front gate and I saw Miss Simon watching for me on the steps. She identified me and I was left in her charge. 
I begged her not to beat me, but she yanked me upstairs into an empty room and lashed me thoroughly. Sobbing, I slunk off to bed, resolved to run away again, but I was watched closely after that. My mother was informed upon her next visit that I had tried to run away and she was terribly upset.
Why did you do it? She asked. I don't want to stay here, I told her. But you must, she said. How can I work if I'm to worry about you? You must remember that you have no father. I'm doing all I can. I don't want to stay here, I repeated. Then if I take you to your father, I don't want to stay with him either, I said. But I want you to ask him for enough money for us to go to my sister's in Arkansas, she said. Again, I was faced with choices I did not like, but I finally agreed. After all, my hate for my father was not so great and urgent as my hate for the orphan home. My mother held to her idea, and one night, a week or so later, I found myself standing in a room in a frame house. My father and a strange woman were sitting before a bright fire that blazed in a grate. My mother and I were standing about six feet away, as though we were afraid to approach them any closer. It's not for me, my mother was saying. It's for your children that I'm asking you for money. <laughs> I ain't got nothing. My father said, laughing. Come here, boy, the strange woman called to me. I looked at her and did not move. Give him a nickel, the woman said. He's cute. Come here, Richard, my father said, stretching out his hand. I backed away, shaking my head, keeping my eyes on the fire. He is a cute child, the strange woman said. You ought to be ashamed, my mother said to the strange woman. You're starving my children. Now don't you all fight, my father said, laughing. I'll take that poke and hit you, I blurted at my father. He looked at my mother and laughed louder. <laughs> you told him to say that, he said. Don't say such things, Richard. My mother said, You ought to be dead, I said to that strange woman. The woman laughed and threw her arms about my father's neck. I grew ashamed and wanted to leave. How can you starve your children? My mother asked.
Let Richard stay with me, my father said. Do you want to stay with your father, Richard? My mother asked. No, I said. You'll get plenty to eat, he said. I'm hungry now, I told him. But I won't stay with you. Oh, give the boy a nickel, the woman said. My father ran his hand into his pocket and pulled out a nickel. Here, Richard, he said. Don't take it, my mother said. Don't teach him to be a fool, my father said. Here, Richard, take it. I looked at my mother, at the strange woman, at my father, then into the fire. I wanted to take the nickel, but I did not want to take it from my father. You ought to be ashamed, my mother said, weeping. Give me your son a nickel when he's hungry. If there's a God, he'll pay you back. That's all I got, my father said, laughing again and returning the nickel to his pocket. We left. I had the feeling that I had had to do with something unclean. Many times in the years after that, the image of my father and the strange woman, their faces lit by the dancing flames, would surge up in my imagination so vivid and strong that I felt I could reach out and touch it. I would stare at it, feeling that it possessed some vital meaning which always eluded me. A quarter of a century was to elapse between the time when I saw my father sitting with the strange woman and the time when I was to see him again, standing alone upon the red clay of a Mississippi plantation, a sharecropper clad in ragged overalls holding a muddy hose in his gnarled, vain hands. A quarter of a century during which my mind and consciousness had become so greatly and violently altered that when I tried to talk to him I realized that, though ties of blood made us kin, though I could see a shadow of my face in his face, though there was an
was an echo of my voice in his voice. We were forever strangers, speaking a different language, living on vastly different planes of reality. That day, a quarter of a century later, when I visited him on the plantation, he was standing against the sky, smiling toothlessly, his hair whitened, his body bent, his eyes glazed with dim recollection. His fearsome aspect of twenty-five years ago gone forever from him. I was overwhelmed to realize that he could never understand me or the scalding experiences that had swept me beyond his life and into an era of living that he could never know. I stood before him, poised, my mind aching as it embraced the simple nakedness of his life feeling how completely his soul was impressioned by the slow flow of the seasons, by wind and rain and sun, how fastened were his memories to a crude and raw past, how chained were his actions and emotions to the direct animalistic impulses of his withering body. From the white landowners above him, there had not been handed to him a chance to learn the meaning of loyalty, of sentiment, of tradition. Joy was as unknown to him as was despair. As a creature of the earth he endured, hardy, whole, seemingly indestructible, with no regrets and no hope. He asked easy, drawling questions about me, his other son his wife, and he laughed, amused, when I informed him of their destinies. I forgave him and pitied him as my eyes looked past him to the unpainted wooden shack from far beyond the horizons that bound this bleak plantation. There had come to me, through my living, the knowledge that my father was a black peasant who had gone to the city seeking life, but who had failed in the city. A black peasant whose life had been hopelessly snarled in the city, and who had at last fled the city, that same city which had lifted me in its burning arms and borne me toward alien and undreamed of shores of knowing. <laughs>